everyone. I hope you had a meaningful Rosh Hashanah, wherever you were. As we discussed last week, last year, last week, that uh, Rosh Hashanah, especially how the mystics explain it, um, the entire creation, entire existence goes into a uh, comatose state before the holiday, only to be renewed. And we discussed at length how we experience renewal, which of course is one of the greatest uh, opportunities in a person's lifetime, that no matter what happened in your life, whatever yesterday or last week or last year brought, you can uh, start anew, which is not so easy. It's easier said than done, simply because we are creatures of habit and patterns and routines. So that class was recorded. If you want to review it, you can. I'm not going to repeat what I said then. What I'd like to discuss today is being that we're now in the days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. These are the holiest days of the, in the Hebrew calendar. <coughs> Excuse me. And Yom Kippur being the holiest day of the year, how we can utilize uh, the power of these days, especially Yom Kippur, to answer the big question, how great can you become? And that's the title of uh, this class. And I say this with a, uh, with a small introduction I'd like to give. Um, despite the fact that many of us, um, I can't say everyone, but many Jews uh, some way or other honor these holidays, because even unaffiliated and secular Jews who comes to Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur have some, at least go to synagogue or try to go. Can't say everyone, but many. And unfortunately, whether you're observant or non-observant, affiliated or unaffiliated, um, you can't help but know the fact is that people are pretty disappointed. And most do not come away from a Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur feeling uh, necessarily rejuvenated or with renewed hope. So though the experience may not always be a negative one, but definitely doesn't necessarily live up to the expectations that one would hope that being the holiest days of the year, you'd think it would have the most powerful and, ra- and revolutionary impact on our lives. Now, I stand corrected if any of you had the different type of, had that experience, and I'd be delighted to hear that. But just from my own little observations and from my travels, I see that that's a tremendous uh, dissonance going on between so-called what the holidays promise, or at least what you expect, and then what they deliver. Uh, this is something that always, always bothered me. I grew up in a traditional world, a very traditional from Hasidic, Chabad Hasidic environment. And I'm not going to go through all my nightmares, uh, but I will share that at whatever age I began becoming more of a spiritual seeker, um, I realized that, um, that it's not the Judaism that doesn't offer this uh, opportunity, it's the teachers and the people who represent it that are uh, falling short of what the power of these days are. And I just mentioned these days as an example. The truth is this is true about Passover and Hanukkah and Purim and, and frankly, every ritual and every tradition. So the focus I've always did in this class, this goes back now uh, 33 years, yeah, 33 years that I'm doing this class, an unbroken chain, has always been to try to attempt to uh, find the spiritual, personal, psychological, and emotional relevance the operative word being relevance to our lives in uh, this, uh, in what we call Judaism. Because frankly, as I said before, and I mentioned, I'll just elaborate some more, many of the rituals, even if you embrace them, and they may be beautiful and heartwarming and nostalgic, but to say that they are indispensable on a psychological, spiritual, emotional, and personal level is a big, is a big leap. And being that uh, when you begin to study, especially the mystical and inner dimension of Judaism, and realize that there's two dimensions to Judaism. One is called as the Zohar, which is the classical work of Jewish mysticism, by, written by, authored by the Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai over uh, almost 2,000 years ago. It states that there's a body to Judaism, or Torah, and there's a soul. So like anything in life, if you only look at the body of something, you only see the mechanics. It's like the mechanics. And the soul is what tells you what is, makes a tick and what uh, t- reaches us. So just like we have bodies and souls, our bodies are just the mechanics, the robot, the machine that we are. And it's the soul that gives it uh, vitality and dynamic energy and, and uh, passion and so on. 
So the same thing with Judaism. If you don't have the soul of it, what you end up having rendering is that you have many traditions and rituals and prayers and, uh, tra- and, and, and all kinds of different uh, uh, commemorative uh, actions, but you don't have necessarily the soul. So what I like, always like to focus on is what is the soul of, the, of Yom Kippur? You know, what's the power of the day? And when you get into the soul, then your soul can connect to that as the soul of the day. And as I've discussed a number of times, that in Judaism, time is energy. And every period of time has its own unique energy. And that energy can be tapped into if you understand what type of energy that is. So the question really on the table then is, what is Yom Kippur? What is the energy of Yom Kippur? You know, we all know that it's the holiest day of the year. Most people have no clue why is it the holiest day of the year. What makes it so special? Why Yom Kippur? Why not another day of the month or year? And once you understand that, then you can begin to say, okay, now how do I access and add uh, the power of this uh, special day? So that will be the focus of the discussion here. And hopefully not only can it help illuminate what Yom Kippur is about, but also help us look with new, a new lens, through a new lens, with a new vision at all of Judaism, and realize that in this body of uh, literature called the Torah, you can find unbelievable and indispensable tools, life tools and life skills that can address every topic that we will go through in our lifetimes, whether it's dealing with pain, dealing with relationships, trying to find our purpose and meaning in life, whatever it is that we struggle with, whatever it is that we face, the Torah can be seen as a blueprint for life. But to do so, as I said, I reiterate, we need to access the soul of the Torah. Because if you just look at the body of it, it's a, it's a, it's a collection of narratives and stories, biblical stories and, uh, and uh, narratives about people that lived thousands of years ago in a different part of the world. But when you look at the soul of the story, the story behind the story, the inside story, then you can realize that there's, the, the, it carries, as I said, extremely personal messages, and it's, uh, messages, and the Torah is as li- alive today as it was then. And that's when everything changes. Then you really can appreciate what its value is. So, and I, I don't want to make any assumptions. So I don't know those sitting right here in the room or anyone listening online, where you stand in this regard. But suffice it to say that it's the soul of Torah that will speak to your soul. And the more you can access that, the more powerful will be your experience. And above all, the most powerful will be your, your, uh, the tools that you have in your life journey to, ch- to deal with any given challenge, to grow to the greatest possible potential that you can grow to. So going back to the title, how great can you become? It's a question that you would think, we could assume, we would hope to assume that anyone asked that question would say, I'd love to be the greatest I can possibly be. You know, if you're born with a particular amount of potential, so it seems to say that each of us would want to actualize that potential to the fullest. And yet you find many people are terrified when you ask them the question, how great you can become. Some are afraid maybe of failure. Some are afraid of success. Some are afraid of the unknown. If you don't know what your potential is like, you know, and you're not comfortable. And above all, we often are very insecure and don't have the confidence. So we stay in our comfort zones without pushing ourselves to the limits. And therefore, unfortunately, our potential is not actualized. So that is a critical question to ask, especially in context of Yom Kippur, as you'll see. But it's just a, 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 it's the opening thought that to give food for thought, to ask yourself that question. And what are you doing to actualize that great potential that you have? Now I'll just jump to the cut to the chase and say the following. From a Torah point of view, from a Jewish point of view, uh, we all have potential that's far more enormous than you can ever imagine. And that's based on one simple principle. You didn't create yourself. You were put here. The fact that God created and created a human being in the divine image, which means that each of us has a, a piece of God. A part, each of us is, has God-like properties. As such, then you have God-like potential. So for anyone to say, you know what, I'm, I'm a nobody. I can never be what, what that person can be. Or I can never actualize or reach heights that uh, others have reached is plain uh, delusion. Based on what are you saying that if you do make that statement? Based on what? How do you know? You know to understand one's potential, you have to be able to go into that dimension. We can know what you're doing. You can't know what you're capable of. You can only know what you're doing. How do you know what you're capable of? 
And very often, our self-perception of what we're capable of, frankly, doesn't even come from our, ourselves. It comes from those around us. If, for example, God forbid, i use an extreme example, if a child grew up in a home and was berated and uh, reprimanded and constantly criticized, of course the child is going to grow up thinking they can't accomplish much. Because the people that were supposed to love that child, the parents and, and other adults, constantly told the child how the child is worthless and unable to do anything. And unfortunately, this, this is a reality. As sad as it is, there are parents and there are adults that tell us the children. Whether they're projecting their own garbage and their own insecurities, or it's just they have a lot of negativity and toxic energy, whatever it is. So obviously, a child like that growing up is not going to believe in themselves because they've been constantly put down. When you have children coming home from school and they feel excited about something they've accomplished, and you have a mother or father who like, you know, dismisses it. Who do you think you are? That type of thing. And unfortunately, this happens as sad as it, said, as it sounds. After a while, a child will start believing what the parents are saying. That I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm worthless. Or I'm not capable. Who do you think you are? What do you think you can accomplish? Especially if parents project their own, what they consider to be success, which is not necessarily a, a perfect standard at all, on a child, children literally will then go into their shell and they'll curl up into their own uh, defense mechanisms and never emerge until either they wake themselves up or someone else they meet that tells them that's not true what you heard, that you do have unbelievable potential. Now, I hope there's no one that I know that, uh, that's listening here that went through such an experience. Unfortunately, I know there are people, so I can't say that. But the fact is that hopefully most of us do not have that extreme. But life beats everybody up. Even if you grow up in a relatively healthy home, it may not have come from parents. It may have come from educators. It may have come from other negative influences. It may have come from, from uh, the society itself. We live in a world that is, uh, unless you really know how to protect yourself and know how to, um, how to uh, gener self-generate energy, people around us can end up really hurting us. You know, in the type of cynicism or skepticism that you hear, let's say you're excited about something and you share it with your friends. I'm sure we all have a list of friends that are always ready to tell us, don't get so excited, don't get so idealistic. I've been there. You know, don't believe uh, that you can do anything you want. And they even think that there's good intentions. They're really trying to like, protect you from, uh, from uh, shattering your, ex your expectations or dreams. You know, I hear this all the time. There's a woman that was talking to me a few like a month ago before the holidays. She's having difficulties in the area of what we call relationships. Now, of course, in New York City, this isn't one person. This is an epidemic. And it's not the first time you hear this. And I, and I asked her, so what do your friends say? Your, my friends say, lower your expectations. Don't think you're going to find love in this world. You try to find here and there some type of short-term something here and there. So imagine your friends are already lowering the expectations. It's not your enemies. Your friends are telling you, don't get so excited. So what, is ha what happens? It just feeds into your own self-doubts and uh, um, amplifies it. And you end up becoming your own worst enemy, along with your social group, basically knocking and, and not allowing your potential to emerge. So we are all, no, one, no, no, you, no man is an island. Each of us is affected by and influenced by our environment, by our friends, by our uh, community, by, by media, by everything you see and hear around us. And if you don't have that uh, solid foundation that generates, as I said, from within, it's very easy to become a uh, victim, or at least a product, of other people's attitudes. So one critical component which we'll talk about is how does one at least free yourself a bit from the influences that all the negative voices that, are, that exist, whether it's inside of you or outside of you. That's number one. And number two, embracing the fact that you have far more potential than you ever can believe. So in a sense, in this context, if you think about it, the concept of God, and you probably know when I use the word God, I'm always very careful because the word God conjures up all kinds of stereotypes and negative images by many people. So I would define God in this context. I would define that the idea of concept of a God, the concept of a greater reality than each of us is, something greater than us, is actually our salvation in the sense 
it gives us an opportunity to reach beyond the mere mortal potential that we have. Because if indeed we are created in the image of God, and we have God-like properties, then no matter what anyone tells you in this world, no matter what anyone, no matter how pessimistic someone may be, you have inside of you as a birth, a God, a, a, your birthright that no one can take away from you because no one has given it to you, not your parents and not your educators and not society, fundamental value. We'll say an indispensable the contribution that you and only you can make. Now, if you knew that in your heart 24-7, you tell me whether other people's words would really be able to draw, uh, draw you down. The problem is we're not that confident in what I just said, that statement. And that leads me to Yom Kippur. What is Yom Kippur exactly? And why is it the holiest day of the year? So, <clears throat> first is some history. What happened in Yom Kippur? Yom Kippur, the Torah says, the tenth day of the month of Tishrei shall be the holiest day, one day a year, where you will, day of atonement. That's what Kippur means, atone. What's in a day of atonement? A day that you can atone for all the iniquities, mistakes, errors, intentional, unintentional that we made throughout the year. That's what most people are familiar with. That's what Yom Kippur is. But why Yom Kippur? Like why suddenly that day of all the days of the year? Why not uh, Passover? Why not another day in the year? Why not Rosh Hashanah for that matter? And the answer is that you need, we need to go back to the history a bit of the Jewish people. When the Jews left Egypt, which would be now 3,300 and I think 27 years ago, or 28 years ago, um, so as we know, 50 days later, that was on the 15th of Nisan when we celebrate Passover. So 50 days later, they arrived at Mount Sinai. And that's where they received the Torah. Sinai in the Sinai Desert. 50 days from the day they left, uh, from, the, from, from, the, from the day after they left Egypt. Okay. Moses went up on the mountain. The Jews heard the Ten Commandments. And Moses remained on the mountain, as the Bible tells us, for 40 days and 40 nights studying with God. On the 40th day, he returned. And to his chagrin, the Jews had built a golden calf. A false god. They basically defied the cardinal sin, the second of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not have graven images, do not have other false gods, other gods. They built a golden calf. With all the different reasons how they did it, what they did, we're not getting into that right now, why they would do such a thing. Well, Moses saw that, and he knew already, because God told him, go down. The Jews have, your people are, have, have, trans, have gravely transgressed. When Moses saw that, he broke the, he shattered the tablets that he came with, the divine tablets, at the bottom of the mountain. And next thing he did was march back up on the mountain. This is the 17th of Tammuz. It's a fast day, actually, the beginning of the three-week, sad three-week period. And Moses went back up on the mountain to pray for forgiveness. That God forgive the people for what they did. He didn't say they weren't guilty. He didn't say they weren't responsible and should be punished for it. But still he asked for forgiveness. And he sp spent another 40 days and nights on, the Mount, on Mount Sinai asking for forgiveness. And he was not successful. So now we have 50 days from Passover till Shavuos, till the giving of the Torah. 40 days that Moses receives the Torah. And then 40 days that he's praying for forgiveness. And he comes back down. What day does he come down? He comes down in Rosh Chodesh El. The first day of the month of Elul, the month preceding the high holiday season. And then he goes up a third time. Been, since he was not successful, he goes up a third time, and he would spend another 40 days and nights. And what's 40 days from the day that he went up the third time? Yom Kippur. Because 30 days of the month of Elul, and 10 days of the month of Tishrei, which is the month we're in now, from Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur is 10 days. 40th day, so basically 120 days he spent in the mountain. 40 days to receive the Torah, 80 days to gain forgiveness. And he finally prevailed. And then when he prevailed, he came back down with a second set of tablets. And he came down on Yom Kippur, glowing, as the Torah describes it, with the power of hope and forgiveness that he brought to the people, the gift. So next Tuesday night, which is Yom Kippur Eve, right after we say Kol Nidre, the three times, Kol Nidre, the haunting melody of Kol Nidre. 
you'll see in every congregation there's one line that's said three times as well. That God said, Salachti kidvarecha. I've forgiven them as you have spoken. This is the essence of Yom Kippur. That a human being called Moses challenged God and would not take no for an answer and he prevailed that God give in and forgive the people. Now, if you think about it, it's one of the most fascinating, perhaps, episodes in history. How a man won over God. And there's an entire chapter in the Bible, in Kisisa, in the book of Exodus, close to the end, that spoke about the dialogue they had. It's actually an expression there. There's an expression that Moses spoke to God like a friend speaks to a friend face to face. It's very cryptic, the verses there, but there are many interpretations. I won't go through all of them right now, but I want to just point out a few key things. So what exactly did Moses say to God that finally succeeded? Well, the argument essentially, the, the, the dialogue they had was, God was telling Moses, I didn't, I'm not interested in punishing them. They brought upon themselves this calamity where they rejected me. They basically betrayed me, a form of adultery, a form of a, of a total betrayal, a total violation of trust. What can I do? The universe works in a form of cause and effect, and the Jewish people brought upon themselves this uh, terrible thing misfortune. And Moses was arguing with God, you're right, there is cause and effect, which means when you put your hand in fire, it gets burned. But you're God, and you're able to transcend the, the rules of nature, so to speak. And I need you to tell me that I can come back to the people and say there's always hope. Because the fact of the matter is, no human beings are perfect. You created the human being imperfect. I'm, obviously, I'm paraphrasing. Moses was arguing, you created the human being as imperfect. So why are you telling me to go build a new nation? A new nation will also sin some point, and you'll also be the, also their uh, d- demise. So you need, to be, you need to give me the promise of hope that even after betrayal, and even after something is broken, and even when a relationship is ruptured, there can be a way to rebuild. Because that's what the human race needs. It needs the hope to know that things are not all lost. It's not like irreversible. The people will be responsible and accountable for what they have to do, but there's nothing that's irreversible. Now can you imagine a man, Moses, arguing with God about this? And he prevails. That's the most powerful thing of all. Now it's not God was playing a game with him, you know, like playing difficult to get, hard to get. It was because, like in any given situation, there's no question that God loved the people. There's no question that God created the human race and created the Jewish people for a purpose and knew quite well that they can make mistakes and they can make, do sin and they can transgress. But Moses was able to elicit from God a deeper love that sometimes can only be seen when things are broken. You know, when, you, when everything's going well, you don't really know the connection that two people have. When you really see that something happened between two friends or two people who love each other, and still they are able to transcend that betrayal, transcend that violation, that shows on the deepest love of all. And Moses was able to dig that deep enough into God, so to speak, and able to convince God to change his mind. Obviously I'm using human terms and all these terms don't apply to God, but so you speak in human terms, that's what he was able to do. And that's why Yom Kippur is the holiest day of the year. You know why? Because Shavuos is a very powerful day. That's when the law was given, the Torah was given. On Passover, we were given freedom. And every holiday has its beauty. Rosh Hashanah, I mentioned, is renewal. But Yom Kippur is the greatest of them all because it comes and tells you that there's no such thing as impossible. It's the birth of hope. And hope is the greatest gift that we were given. You know, it's very nice to say, for example, if someone were to say, ask for one, one, ask one, ask one, ask one, ask one, have made one request to God, what would it be? So a juvenile, a childish response would be, give me a perfect life. An adult response would be, is give me the strength that no matter what happens, I have the hope and confidence that I can get through it. That is a far wiser request. Why? Because it means I have the resources that I need to deal with every challenge. To say I'll never have a challenge is not realistic. That's not the way life works. You want to know that no matter what challenge you have, you have an equal amount of strength to deal with it. If you have that absolute confidence, then you can get through anything. 
Because we all know, look, life is filled with all kinds of curveballs, and everybody in their life has their own challenges, some harsher than others. You know, losses, things we don't expect, a script we write for ourselves, and then it's, the whole thing is, the whole cart is overturned. Everybody's got their story. And if you think about it, but the real difficulty is not necessarily the losses, the traumas, the betrayals, or whatever it is that we experience. It's really that we also lose strength when it happens. If we were dealing, or dealt with a difficult challenge, but we also knew we had the strength to deal with it, it's a whole different story. But once you get demoralized, the demoralization is always worse than the initial problem. You know, think of it this way. Two people, let's say, God forbid, in a hospital. One of them has guests and friends and gifts and people coming. And another one's lying in bed. There's no one comes to visit. No one cares. They both maybe suffer from exactly the same illness. But one has a support. And that support builds up strength in you and you want to fight. And the other one, even though the illness may be even, even, we, even weaker, but once you're demoralized, once you feel that nobody cares, and you don't have anyone, anyone to, and you have nothing to look forward to, you don't even get out of this place, no one cares. It has to demoralize the spirit and has to weaken the immunity system and therefore the resolve to, to heal. And this is proven. This is not some type of uh, matter of faith. This is proven reality. That demoralization is always worse than the original problem. Because it doesn't give you, you don't feel the strength to fight. <clears throat> so Yom Kippur comes and tells us, and that's why Moses felt it was so important. He would never leave the mountain until God would grant him forgiveness. Because it wasn't just for the Jewish people then. It was for all of history, till this day, that we should know, no matter what happens, there's no such thing as impossible. There's no such thing as something completely broken. It does not exist, period. And look at the Jewish people as an example. That's why we're here. Because we never accepted any obituary or any uh, uh, a prognosis of utter annihilation. Not during the Holocaust and not during all the other persecutions and uh, genocides and pogroms and everything that was perpetrated on us. Because we held on to the promise and belief that even if we go through the most difficult times, we can get through anything. And that which doesn't kill us makes us stronger, as is a, a more of a contemporary version of this. But it's not just words. If someone were to say this 3,000 years ago, you could say, okay, it's nice wishful thinking. But we could look at history and look at the fact. Look at the Jewish people. I read newspaper accounts. In 1945, 1946, they said by the year 19... 95, there won't be any Jews left on earth. And the logic was very simple. It was mathematical. Six out of 18 million were completely annihilated, right? Ex literally decimated. Their, all their survivors were, had no family, had no money, had no country, had no home. Judaism in America was on the down, big downtime. Assimilation was rampant. There was no Israel. So what would you, if you were a basic statistician, what would you say in 1946? Like, what would happen with the Jewish people? Of course, the leaders, the teachers, the rabbis, they all disappeared in, the, in Eastern Europe. And yet, look today. It doesn't mean the assimilation still exists. We have high rates of intermarriage. There's plenty of challenges. But we're standing. Maybe limping a bit, but we're standing. Not only here, but all over the world. So... No one can tell anybody today that, there, that, it's, that there's something is impossible. The impossible became possible. And it all started with one man challenging God and eliciting that power of hope that there's always a way, a back door, always. And that's why Yom Kippur is the holiest day of the year. Simply put, it's a day that reminds us that anything can be achieved. And if you can't connect, and I'm sorry, and if, and if you believe that, anything can be overcome. Now, the question, of course, is how do we hold on to it? Because we go back to life, and there's plenty of reminders that tell us that we're not really doing that well, as I mentioned before. But the first thing we have to state is the power. That is Yom Kippur energy. That's the energy of Yom Kippur. And that's why we start Yom Kippur, by the way, with Kol Nidre. I don't know if you ever thought of it. Kol Nidre is a very beautiful and haunting melody. But if you think of the words that we say, they seem very strange to begin the holiest day in a very, like Kol Nidre, it's like basically reiterating ten different ways that we're absolving ourselves of all our oaths and our vows and our commitments 
and our promises and so on. All stated very beautifully and very poetically, but what kind of uh, opening of that keeps us hostage? That's why you begin the day, the holiest day. First thing is, free ourselves of the past. Untie yourself of everything. It's completely scratched, like a newborn child. Literally like going back to becoming a newborn child. And newborn children don't have the burdens that come through life, the, the abuses, the dysfunctionality, the toxins and everything that affects us as we grow older. You know, think of like freshly fallen snow. I know we're far away from a snow in New York, but you get the idea. Freshly fallen snow, there's something beautiful about it. You wake up in the morning, and you see a complete blanket of white. That's a symbol of the newborn child that each of us is on Yom Kippur, which is why we wear white and why we do everything possible to stay away from material involvement, whether it's even eating or drinking. You know, it's a day of complete angelic day, as much as possible, as humanly possible, to try to separate ourselves from the material bounds, binds, that, that, uh, the material uh, chains that bind us. So it's going into a certain state of being, a certain state of mind. It's not just another day, not just another night. And the more you prepare yourself in that sense, the more you can take advantage of this day. So now, talk about what, you know, what, we're, what our possibilities are. Now, here's the good news. We're all born, as I just said, as pure children. A child that comes out of its mother's womb doesn't have any of the anxieties and the worries and the fears that we will develop as we get older. Why is that so critical? Because, the, but because it's essentially, if we indeed we were born pure children, so that purity is that's your inherent state, that's who you really are. And I think just to capture the point, let's use, uh, I remember two years ago, before Rosh Hashanah, I received this beautiful note from a woman who was in, uh, living in Austin, Texas, then she moved to Seattle. And she writes that she had a terrible year that year, went through a very ugly divorce, many other issues that really... Um, it's very disturbing for her, but she would always, she was writing to me to thank me because one uh, ray of light that came to her every week was the email that I would send out every Thursday night. The email list, I would send out a thought. And she always looked forward she said, to that, and it was like a beacon of light, a certain ray of hope amidst all the darkness she went through. Okay, so that was nice. Not nice to hear that she was so disturbed, yeah, but it was nice to hear that at least there was some light. And then she concluded the following. She says, I am a sculptor by profession and I haven't sculpted in a long time. But reading one of your essays reminded me what Michelangelo, one of the greatest sculptors of all time, said that when he was asked, how do you carve those beautiful angels out of the marble? And his response was, I see the angel trapped in the marble and I carved and carved and set her free. And then she concludes, she she says, thank you for setting my angel free. Now what the the essence of this is, is really a very fundamentally Jewish concept. We are not, and this is, I don't want to pull rank here, but as opposed to the predominant Christian view of the human being, that we are essentially controlled by the devil and by evil. And that's why you have to believe in a certain Jew to free yourself of that. We Jews believe that you are fundamentally creating the divine image and there, and there is no such thing as original sin, which means we are fundamentally good people, not fundamentally bad people. And this is not a small statement because the prevalent view in Western thought is what I like to call the Darwinian Freudian model. And that is that in Freud's terms, the id, id, is the driving force inside of us, which is what? A selfish self-absorbed narcissist that's interested in its own pleasure, the sexual pleasure. And then there's an ego and a superego that so-called monitor and somewhat harness and control that inner craving, inner narcissist. You know, um, some call social Darwinism that's captured by Richard Dawkins, our uh, resident atheist of our times, one of them. So he has a book called The Selfish Gene. That's what it's called, The Selfish Gene. Making the argument, the radical evolutionary argument that life 
Every species and every cell is selfish. All it's interested is in its own survival. If its survival requires cooperation with someone else, great. But it's also for selfish reasons. A very pessimistic view on life, basically. In contrast to all of that, the Torah says, and thank God the Torah precedes all these great thinkers, that the human being is fundamentally a good creature, a divine creature, which can be concealed, like Michelangelo said, in marble, in concrete, in other substances. But at the heart of it, you're a pure divine entity forever and ever. And it's not the id that drives you, but it's the yid, the yid, the pintle yid, the spark, called it spark of the divine, that's really the, like the pilot flame within you. The soul. And the shama shenasatibi taharihi. The soul that you've given me, as we say every morning in the prayer, is pure. So no matter what happens to you in life, may obfuscate that, it can conceal it, it can veil it, shield it, whatever, all the different words you want to use. It may hide and protect itself in very many thick layers of armor to protect ourselves, but the spark never extinguishes. And that's what Moses revealed on Yom Kippur, and that's what God acknowledged. The spark never goes out. No matter how much what happens. And we see it in our own lives. The fact of the matter was, each of us began as a newborn child, pure. And God forbid, even if you had the worst possible parents, or no parents, they just abandoned you. I don't want to say you. They abandoned someone. You still have that spark. It's true, healthy parents would nurture it, would cultivate it, would reassure you, reinforce and validate that spark within you. So of course it gives you a much greater chance of uh, actualizing it. But regardless what happens, the spark never disappears. So Yom Kippur says, The day itself forgives. Even if you do nothing that day. Even if you sleep all day. The day itself has power. Now obviously that's not a uh, a recommendation. That's what you should do. I just meant to say that in case the worst scenario, the spark doesn't go out. Now obviously our goal here is to use Yom Kippur to the fullest so you can actualize it as much as possible. But the point is the angel is there inside of you. The flower is inside of you. The music is inside of you. And it never goes away. So the first lesson is this, that Yom Kippur teaches us, know, you must know this with absolute certainty. No matter what you tell yourself, no matter what other voices inside of you tell you that you're not able to do this, you're not worth it, you're not that, you're not valuable, Despite what other people tell you, what society tells us, what advertising tells us that you're only valuable if you look this way, if you dress this way, if you purchase this car, or if you drive that, or you smoke that, or drink that. Despite all that, your value that's inherent, and you have to hold on to that message for your dear life. And then comes step two, how we um, internalize it into the person who we've become. Because, fine, let's say with all the canals, no problem. We all began as this pure, fall, purely fallen snow, the pure angel, which is that newborn child that you and I were at once. But then life took over. Then we didn't have to, we, sub, we were subject to whatever happened in our homes, what happened in our societies, in our schools, the different abuse we may have endured, the different uh, violations, the different betrayals, the different uh, forms of invalidations. And I include everything in there, from the worst to the most subtle. So it's very nice to say that I'm still that child and I still have the spark, but now there's a whole new reality. Now it's no longer freshly fallen snow. The snow has been tread upon and doesn't look as white anymore. So, number one, as I just said, we must know that even when it may not seem like the spark is still alive, it's still there, despite what you think and despite what you believe. And number two, you could access it. Yom Kippur is the easiest day in the year to do so. But of course the challenge is not in Yom Kippur alone, it's to how to carry it over the next day. Because even if you can reach Yom Kippur a state of some form of uh, serenity on that level, what do you do that when, you re- when you hit back, uh, you come back to earth? You know, after the hangover. 
I don't mean here a hangover because Yom Kippur we fast, but you get the idea. After the high, what happens the day after that, which we'll talk about in a moment. So the first thing is having that absolute confidence and surround yourself with people that have that confidence in you. Because the fact of the matter is, once you've lost belief in yourself, or to some extent you're not so sure, let's not even say that you've lost belief. You're not sure. You're like undecided. Or they say, the guy that said, I used to think I'm indecisive, now I'm not so sure, you know? <laughs> so let's say you're indecisive. So how do you get yourself out of that rut? Well, one of the ways is to surround yourself with friends that believe in that spark inside of you. Guaranteed, if you don't have such friends and you have the other, you're definitely going to, uh, they're definitely going to tip the scale toward the negative attitude. So I'm not going to tell you to go get rid of the pessimistic and negative friends in your life. It's not my job to tell you that. You have to tell yourself that. You know, but you get the idea. Maybe it's time to look at your Rolodex or your contact list or whatever you call it today. Your WhatsApp group. I don't know. Everybody's got their things. And see how much of it is reinforcing and making you feel better and how much of it makes you feel worse. And I remember when I remember, I don't know how old I was. I was a kid. I used to always ask these questions. I remember someone told me they had to go to a meeting. Now, a kid, you know, your kids don't know what meetings are. What's a meeting? So I asked someone, what's a meeting? I must have been six, six seven years old. But I never forgot what he answered me because now I understand it. He said, remember this, young man, young boy. It wasn't my father. It was someone. I forgot who it was. He said to me, a meeting is one of two things. It either drains you or empowers you. Always remember that. So now till this day, whenever there's a meeting, I always say to myself, is it dra- did it drain me or did it empower me? You know? So the question you have to ask yourself is, like when you look at people that you are accustomed to, at work, uh, people you socialize with, you hang out with, whatever it is, are they draining you or are they empowering you? I don't mean to be insulting or condescending. I don't think you have to make an announcement and tell them, hey, you know what, I'm saying goodbye to you because you drain me. But you, you, you have to, uh, huh? That would be a little rude, but you have to do it in a more, uh, I guess, tactful way where you uh, just fill your... Your, your time with more positive energy. Let's put it this way. It doesn't have to be cold turkey. You slowly adjust, you know. It's just like, let's be honest. If you have toxic air that you're breathing, unless you open the windows and get some fresh air in, the toxic air will become your uh, comfort zone. And that's what you get accustomed to. Now, it's not so easy. People sometimes hold on to their so-called unhealthy uh, connections because that's your, the known evil is better than the unknown evil. And comfort zones are much more powerful than we think. The status quo is strong. So the first thing is, besides believing that you have that in you, it's surrounding yourself with people that also believe that. Because that, they can help you get to a uh, stronger connecting to that part of yourself. So that's number two. And number three, which is, of course, the real work of how do you make that a part of your, vi- a, a part of your uh, a viable reality in your life. So the formula is quite simple in a way, but also difficult because, again, of our patterns and routines. And that is what we learn from Yom Kippur. We learn from Yom Kippur is that um, that is the holiest day of the year. It's a sacred day. So what exactly is sanctity? What does sanctity mean? Because if we can so-called bottle sanctity and turn it into some type of formula that you can replicate then maybe you can draw from the sanctity of Yom Kippur into the rest of the year. So you'll find in the Torah many times the expression, Kedoshim Tiyu, you shall be sacred, you shall be sanctified, you shall be holy. Many, many times. It's numerous times with the Torah, especially in the book of Vayikra Leviticus. Vizkadashtim v'yisim Kedoshim. Sanctify your life and be sacred, be holy, be holy. So the commentators talk about the word Kodesh, Kedusha, even marriage is called Kedushin, sanctification. Kedushin. What exactly is this thing called sanctity? This holy day, the holy of holies, Kedush Kadashim, when the high priest once a year went into for a few little short while into, Yom, into the holy of holies. When was it? On Yom Kippur. So you may know the Sefer Yitzir, the Book of Formation, considered one of the maybe the earliest Kabbalistic work some attributed to Abraham, it's structured around time, space, and soul. Eilam shana nefesh. Oshan. 
Eilam Shon and Nefesh, acronym. What today physics calls man, time, space, and man, man the, the, what the mystics call time, space, and soul. So Yom Kippur, the holiest soul, the high priest, entered the holiest space, the Holy of Holies, in the ho- holiest time of the year, Yom Kippur. So it's a convergence of time, space, and soul in the holiest. But what exactly is holiness? So in Tanya, Abshner Zam Liyadi translates holiness as being anything that is bottle, that's sublimated to something higher, to the divine, is considered holy. Anything that's absorbed with its own ego is the opposite of holiness. So in a sense you could say ego is profane, and the holy is egolessness. And simply stated, you know, when you're filled with yourself, like an inflated balloon, as the Talmud says, Ani v'hug, about an arrogant person, that God says, I and an arrogant person cannot dwell under the same canopy. There's simply no room for two. It's like a filled cup. They say some masters in the East, when you come to them for the first time to, for instruction, the custom is you bring them a cup of water. So people think that's a form of service, like showing that you're a subject, you know, you're accepting, surrendering to this master. But that's not the case. You come to the master, he takes the cup of water, turns it over, spills it out, gives it back to you and says to you, come back to me when you look like this cup. Empty. A full cup can be filled. Even if it's beautiful uh, wine and great uh, and, and, and a beautiful drink. If it's filled, it can be filled. It can be, it can be filled more. If a person has it all figured out and they're already filled, filled with their own presence, so obviously there's nothing else that can enter. There's no room for it. <clears throat> so the Hasidic, talk, the Hasidic text, it talks about the concept of bittel. Bittel means being able to empty yourself, suspend yourself to allow something greater in. And the Alter Rebbe and Tanya says that's what defines Kedusha. So let's take, what's the holiest things we have on earth? Holy objects, we call Dvarim Kedushim. Tashmish Kedushim. Means holy items, and they have laws about them. So a Sefer Torah, of course, is considered one of the holiest things. A mezuzah. Tefillin. Okay? They have a certain level of holiness, it's more, let's say, than the holiness of a prayer shawl. Tashmish Mitzvah, Tashmish Kedusha. Now what defines their holiness? What makes a Sefer Torah holy in the sense that when, when, when someone we rise when the Sefer Torah enters the room? Sefer Torah is made of parchment, which is in turn made of animal hide that was uh, tanned, turned into parchment, and then a scribe, sanctifying himself, wrote the, the holy letters of Torah on this parchment. Taking essentially a hide of an animal that could have been in the wild, but that didn't have anything that we would call holy, and turning it into a holy object. It's called a cheftze shal gedusha. It's called a, a holy object. What makes this holy? Because now it's been designated by a human being to be used strictly and only from now on for holy purposes. Once the parchment becomes a Torah scroll, you can never use it for anything else. It's completely dedicated to becoming parchment, for holy words to be studied, to understand God's wisdom, God's will. So when an object in this earth no longer is being used for private use, I'm not talking about for bad use, for destructive use, God forbid, even for neutral use. You know, we use all the time, we write, we write uh, notes and letters with these, on paper. Once it's been taken out of the realm what we call rishus, rishus means neutral, and been designated completely for something greater than itself, it becomes a holy object. So what's holiness? Is instead of it serving itself, it's serving a higher purpose. When you say a person is holy, you know, you say a person, what does that mean? Instead of just dedicated to his own needs, and again, I'm not talking about necessarily bad things, but his own needs or her own needs, an ish kodesh is someone that's completely designated their life to something greater than themselves. We just read it in the Haftorah on, uh, on the first day of Rosh Hashanah, when Hannah in her most moving way goes to pray for a son, for a child. And she says to God, give me a child and I will give him away to you. Now she meant giving him away, obviously, that his life would be dedicated not to be, go to business, not to take care of himself, but to dedicate it to God's service. And that's why she names him Shmuel. Exactly that. 
Now, can that be demanded of all of us 24-7 to be that type of dedication? Perhaps not. That's why you have a tribe called Shevet Levi, the Kohanim. They were the Sharsi Bakadish, Mesharsi Bakadish. They were dedicated. That's why they were not allowed to have private property. Because their lives were dedicated to serve. Maimonides has a very interesting statement at the end of his laws of Shemitah and Yovel in this book of laws, he says that not Shevet Shev Levi alone, but any person that designates their lives, dedicates their lives, I should say, to a cause greater than themselves, also assumes the role of Holy of Holies. So essentially the Holy of Holies is a, is a place on earth, when the temple stood, that you can say was a, um, an interface between the divine and earth, between heaven and earth. When people ask the question, where does heaven meet earth? Where does heaven kiss earth? The Holy of Holies. Jacob called it the gate to heaven, where he fell asleep on that temple mount. So the Holy of Holies is a place on earth that's physical, but a place that's completely dedicated to something that's not physical. So it becomes a model for us, a symbol for us of what holiness is. How does that translate into our lives? It means, if you want to connect to that place of utter value as you were a newborn child that transcends everything you went through in your life, you have to have holiness in your life. You have to be makadish. You have to sanctify a part of your life. Now, we're not asked to do it 24-7, as I said, but we have to have something in our lives that's completely pure. Whether it's a day of the week, whether it's an hour in the week, whether it's a place in your home, something that's not tainted by ego, by self-interest, and by the other forces of life that are so-called the human aspects. So essentially, how do you reintroduce the, that pure child inside of you? By designating something in your life that's as pure as that child was. And that could be the moments of Torah that we study, the volunteer time that we give to help another person, the other things that we choose that are not about our self-interest. That's what brings Kedusha in your life. In truth is, every mitzvah that you do, we say, Asher Kedushanu, Bemitzvah you who sanctifies us with these mitzvahs, mitzvahs, as you know, come from the word connections. That's what a mitzvah means, to connect. So a connection means, what is it connecting? It's drawing into your life something that's greater than yourself. So to put it this way, in a, in a simple formula, you can say, as great as you are, you can only be as great as you are. But if you dedicate your life to something greater than you are, you become an extension of that greatness. If you dedicate your life to immortality, you become an agent, a channel for immortality. So though life definitely can hurt us, and all of us go through experience in life that can scar, wound, and all the other words I used earlier, but there's a part of us that remains intact. And when we sanctify the outer part of our life, we can access that pilot flame into the life that we have right now. And that is the counterforce to all the abuse and all the other negative forces in life that can draw you down and to pull you down. And Yom Kippur is the, is the day of the year when that power is unleashed in the strongest possible way. Yom Kippur itself, there are five prayers that correspond to the five dimensions of the soul all progressing from the outer dimensions of the soul, I'll, mention, I'll explain them in a moment, to the innermost dimension, to that pilot flame, to the child, to that pure place that we're in. So all year round, we, we have three prayers in the day. On Shabbat, Shabbos and holidays, we have four prayers. And in Yom Kippur, the only time of the year, we have five. So there are five dimensions to the soul. They're called in Hebrew, Nefesh, Ruach, Neshama, Chay Yechid. What they correspond to is nefesh is biological life. So when you say you're alive, what does that mean? So medically, biologically, life means you're breathing, your heart's beating, your mind is working. The vital organs are functioning. But a person could be biologically alive, but they can be like, they'll say, you know, I feel like I'm a zombie. I feel like I'm dead. Because a second level of life is emotional life. Not just that you're breathing, but you also have an emotional life. You feel, you love, you're attracted, you're drawn to things. Then there's a, that's called ruach. The next is neshama, that's intellectual life. That's your mind is alive, you're stimulated, you're interested, you're curious, you're growing intellectually. 
Then comes the fifth, fourth level is called Chaya. And that's transcendent life, that you have a spiritual life. So we have biological, we have emotional, intellectual, now spiritual. And the fifth level is Yechida called oneness. It's the spark. It's a, the core, core being of who you are. So all year round, we can access the first three. On Shabbat and holidays, we can access the fourth and the Yom Kippur, the fifth prayer, Ne'ila, the only prayer where the whole ark is open throughout, is when all the doors are open, because all the doors in your soul are open as well, all the way to the purest place that you are. And that's why at the end of Ne'ila, when we say Shema, and they say three times Baruch Shem, and then Hashem Olekim, it's a moment where it says that you have the closest moment that you can reconnect to the purest point that you were when you were born. And not just reconnect and then it closes. When you draw that into your life and by through sanctifying different aspects of your life, that's how you can undo or at least transcend the different um, scars that we picked up throughout life. So it's a formula. Didn't say it's easy, but it works. And those that do it, can actually grow to places that you could never imagine. So when you ask the question, how great can we become? You, who, never, who knows how great you can become? We don't even know what our potential is like, so how can we even answer that question? Well, one thing is for sure. Your greatness is trapped in layers and layers and layers of marble or concrete or other substances, your own negative perception, the negative energy around you, your own uh, life routines and habits that you've become accustomed to. So the greatness remains trapped like a, trapped in a dungeon waiting to be released. And, has the, and you can release it, but you have to do something about it. You have to connect to the place where, where it lies at rest and then draw it out of there. And we do that through sanctifying our material lives. Even on a simple level, you eat a piece of food. So Yom Kippur we don't eat. But when you do eat, before Yom Kippur, after, you could just indulge in that piece of food or you can make a blessing. Baruch HaToshem. You bless it. What are you doing? You're sanctifying the food that's entering inside of you. A simple act of a simple meal, which most of us, most of us just take for granted, that we indulge in, can be either a self-indulgent act, it could be a neutral act, or it could be a sacred act. Your table can become an altar, and your meal becomes an offering. And the same thing is with all the details of our lives. You walk down the street. Most people don't think of, I'm just walking down the street, I'm commuting, what's the big thing? But there's divine providence, there's a divine choreography around you. You never know, you may be walking near somebody that you think is just a random thing. Maybe God wanted you to meet that person, say a kind word. We have the opportunity to sanctify every moment of our lives. But you have to pay attention to it, and you can't be self-absorbed. Because self-absorbed is all about me and me. What am I getting out of it? When you see yourself as an agent and an ambassador for some higher purpose, you're sanctifying your life. And no one cannot do some of this in their lives. The extent how much we can be aware of it all the time and uh, it may take time to grow. But it's, a, but it's a different attitude. It's seeing yourself as basically that your soul was sent to this earth on a, mess, on a mission. You're on a mission here. And your mission is not what you think it is. It's not what you think is a mission, your job or other things that you're involved in. The mission is what God wants of you. And what God wants of you is to sanctify the corner of your life, to take your material activities, to take your mundane behavior and do something with it that's more than just for yourself, something for a greater cause. And when you do that, you sanctify it. On the full scale level, it's Yom Kippur, where we're asked for 26 hours the whole 24-hour period, 26-hour period. Some people fast 26 hours because the fast begins, let's say, what is it, this year, around 7 o'clock? Who knows? Whatever, sundown time. And it goes till around 8 o'clock. Some people, 26 is the gematria of Yud Kevavke, the God's holy name. But regardless, 24 hours, it's a 24-hour period, like an oasis of complete sanctity. And the more you can saturate yourself with that on that day, the more the power that you have to then let it spill over and express itself in the rest of your life. So this is the formula. Now doing it, of course, is always harder than saying it. Because doing it means committing. But when you understand and can meditate on the, at least the concept, the Yom Kippur is this holy power. You have five levels of the soul. 
Most of us are functioning on a biological level, to be very frank. A little emotions and some intellectual, but not much, you know. And we have two other dimensions that really remain mostly, uh, uh, mostly dormant. And in Yom Kippur, the fifth door opens, the fifth dimension. And it's accessible. It's accessible. So to sum up what I've said is, number one is you have to believe in yourself and in your spark that's always alive, the child in you. Number two, you be around people that reinforce that. That's critical. Because people that weaken it will not let you hold on to it strongly. And number three is to sanctify. To sanctify your life and use Yom Kippur in the fullest sense to be able to achieve that. So it's not just about holiness and God and so on. It's also about your ultimate potential. And as long as one doesn't do these, these things, what happens is the angel will be trapped in the marble. you need to do a lot of carving. So you might as well start now instead of wait for it to harden even further. Because as we all know, you know as, as young children, we're very resilient. Our bones are very flexible. And as we, our, as we grow older, our arteries harden. Our attitudes harden. Our personalities harden. And it becomes far more difficult. We don't become that dexterous and that flexible. So the faster you begin, the better it is. But know for sure, your soul inside of you is completely intact. It does not age. It's not subject to the, 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 the deterioration and the mortality of the forces of this world because it's a soul. But the question is whether you have access to it. Are you living on that dimension or are you living on the mortal dimension? And the fact is most of us are busy at work, busy trying to survive, when people are asked, what are you, who are you? They give you their business card. So your business card is what you do, not who you are. Who you are is your soul, that spark. And the more you familiarize yourself with that soul, the more you can actualize it. So Yom Kippur is a day where the soul comes and says, let's get to know each other for a day. You know, put everything else aside. Let's just spend 24 hours, 26 hours with each other. And we'll both be different. Who's both? Meaning the soul, your soul and how the rest of you manifests the outer dimensions, the masks we wear, the armor we wear, the defense mechanisms, the complex defense mechanisms we have. So Yom Kippur is a day of vulnerability in a sense as well. Vulnerability with yourself and learning to trust yourself, learning to trust the real you, which is the soul, the child that's inside of you. And like any child that's been hurt, if the child doesn't feel safe, it won't emerge. The child feels safe, your old inner child, your inner spark will emerge. So that's the Yom Kippur message. And then, as you know, four days after Yom Kippur starts another holiday called Sukkot. I mention this because there won't be any classes because of the holidays all uh, is uh, right there. So what happens to Sukkot? Sukkot is the celebration of the sanctity that we gain in Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is a day of awe. It's a serious day. But when do we start dancing? Four days later, why we dance? Because we've accessed our own inner selves. Now, I've written about these subjects in different ways. I've written a book called 60 Days that some of you may be familiar with. We send out a daily email, an exercise that talks a lot about this message. So if any of you want more material on this, I'm happy my office, just send us an email. I'm happy to send you a bunch of articles, stuff I've written about this. But it's fascinating because really it's the story of our own lives, how we, have, we, we, we began pure, then in some ways we were betrayed, we, were dis we got disappointed, dreams were shattered, promises were broken, there was abandonment here, abandonment there. And Yom Kippur is the story of re reconciliation, being able to regain the hope as Moses achieved with God, that you can return, not just return, but you can be stronger for it. So it's like a story of love, betrayal, and reconciliation. Love, betrayal, and return. Rebuilding. And all of us go through these stages because everyone is not as pure as they were today as they were when they were newborn children. As I always say in technology, an iOS phone 8, version 8, is better than version 7. But in human beings, I think version 1 is better than version 8, meaning our best of us is our childhood, our young childhood. And then we lose our innocence. But Yom Kippur tells us you can regain your innocence. And now regain it as a mature adult who's gone through the fire, and now knows how to regain that pure place. Yechida, Yilayachdecha, that oneness that is connected to something beyond everything and that can enter into our realities, into our existence, and inform and elevate the rest of our lives 
and by sanctifying it. So everyone should have a very blessed year, Gemach Simeteva, as we say now, a sanctified Yom Kippur. But we have a number of days still to prepare for it. It's almost a week. Yom Kippur will be in a week from today. Actually, Tuesday, so it's six, six days. So the more you prepare for this, the, like the like the Kohen Gadol, seven days before Yom Kippur, he separated himself and began to prepare for this sacred day, for the time he would enter the Holy of Holies. Each of us is like a mini high priest. That's why when we say it uh, in the prayer, we, we recreate the service of the high priest. And we say that, Yehi Ratzin, may it be just like he entered the Holy of Holies, that all of us should have that same experience. And it should be a blessed year in every possible way. Which means for healthy relationships, those that need to find their soulmates, healthy children, life and health, and uh, abundant parnasa, materially. And as uh, the Balatanya says, God should give everyone a lot of material and you should make from matter energy, which is uh, spirituality. That's how we do it. So sanctifying the material. And we will not be having a class next week. It will be in the next two weeks. Uh, two weeks, next week won't be a class because it's Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is next Wednesday. So the week after Nahomet, I won't be here. I'll be out of town. And the week after, I probably also be. But the next week, the, the, uh, the three weeks, I'll probably record one. And if you get the emails, I'll announce it all. Do you, have, do you get the emails? Yeah. If not. Two weeks, do you have a class? No. Next week, not the three weeks. There won't be a class now. It'll be in four weeks from today. So in a month, you'll have a class. Yeah, it's four weeks sounds less than a month, but uh, yeah, that's correct. <laughs> Twenty-eight days. Uh, but I will have no one second. Three weeks from now, there'll be a recorded class because I won't be back. Okay, um, but follow your emails. You get all the information there. If you have, if you if you don't leave your email address, please right there on the on the table there. So we send out stuff, so we'll be able to help to send it out to you. Again, it's a great honor to enter this new year, Tav Shanai and Vav. May it be a very blessed year for every, everyone individually and collectively. A year of, also a year of peace, especially in Israel, and for Jews everywhere, for people everywhere. A year of Geula, of redemption. Thank you very much. Go ahead.